Hi, everyone. Oh, my goodness. We're going to make a start. Um, so, um, welcome. Thank you all for being here. It's an um, amazing turnout. And in terms of, I've never seen so many colleagues in the room for a long time, so that's wonderful. Um, so, I, I think I know everybody in the room, but I'm Hazel Clark, and I've been leading this project for the last few years. I just want to begin by a little bit of context um, for the project. You've, you've got the the little schedule um, we put together there. But just to, I mean, many of you actually know about this research award because it's the, the second year that we're offering the Geraldine Stutz Research Award. Um, but I just want to give you a little bit of background and also we'll hear um, a little bit later on a bit more about Geraldine Stutz herself. So um, I put together this research project, um, which began in 2013 with a generous um, financial assistance from the Geraldine Stutz Trust. And from 2013 to 16, we actually did some research on Geraldine Stutz herself and her career at Henry Bendel's, which was from the late 1950s to the mid 1980s, which is also the period that we're going to hear about, um, part of that period later um, this evening when we hear about the work of Anne Kegi. So Geraldine Stutz, as I think most of you know, was um, really significant in New York City because she changed Bendel's from being a basically carriage trade shop to a really influential fashion shop and had a lot of innovations in her time, not least the famous street of shops on the, the ground floors, as well as working with um, New York-based designers like Stephen Burroughs, but also bringing international designers such as Jean Muir from London to, to New York. So she, she made a lot of significant fashion retail innovations. But when I found out about Geraldine Stutz before this project began, I realized that she was many one of many sort of unsung um, women in New York who've contributed to fashion, some of whom are designers, but there are many others who've been involved in fashion in other ways, for example, in retail, and of course, as we'll hear this evening, in education. So from 2013 to 16, we had um, researchers working on Geraldine Stutz and Bendel's, and they included um, research assistant Lauren Sagador and also Maureen Brewster, who I'm really pleased to see is, is in the audience um, this evening. Um, and then when that project ended, um, and it's, there's a website, which I think many of you will know, which you, you can access um, through um, this link, we, dis there was, we decided that with, again, the support of the trust, we would continue this project as a student research prize. So we did that last year, and this year, again, we um, asked for entries, and um, tonight we're hearing um, about um, the piece of research that became fully developed through that, that, that project um, by Caroline Powell and Linda Shue, who are going to present in just a moment. So the um, prize encourages, um, obviously it asks for either Parsons students or alumni to work on women in New York fashion um, really throughout the 20th century, but so preceding or succeeding or during the period of Geraldine Stutz, but also encouraging um, the use of Parsons archives. And as I said, we've, we've got examples of all of that happening in the research we're going to have presented this evening. Um, I'd also just um, like to thank my colleagues Rachel Lifter and Elizabeth Morano who helped me um, read um, the presentations for the awards and help steer through the process. And I'd also um, like to thank for this evening Daniel Bowers and her team in the ADHT office just for making this happen. I mean, I think as many of you know, we've, we've had sort of Floods and fire, well, we haven't had floods, we had the flood before, we've had the fire now, and whatever happens next, we'll, we'll see. But anyway, we've had a certain amount of mayhem in Parsons over the last few weeks, so even getting this to happen and to have food and drinks has been um, something quite <laughs> much more remarkable. So thanks to Danielle and her team, and also thanks to Diana Duke for the um, wonderful graphics. Um, and I'd finally like to thank Dean Sarah Lawrence, who's also supported this event happening. So um, basically, this is just some more from the, the website, which includes um, 
events which we had um, celebrating the research in progress. If you haven't looked at it, there's, um, there's um, interviews, moving images, there's still images, so you can look at that. And we will um, add this research to the website in, in due course. So I'd like, to, and actually just to go back to the um, title for this evening. So Caroline and Linda have been working on Anne Kegi, as you know. Um, I've, actu I've called their presentation um, Parsons Fashion Education Then and Now, because I was very struck in speaking to them about their work and, and the contribution of Anne Kegi to Parsons Fashion Education, how much things have changed significantly, but also you know, how Kegi, in many ways, without the ground she had laid, we would probably not be where we were today in an interesting way, even though things have changed. So I thought um, it would be an interesting opportunity to have a wider discussion after the um, presentation of the research and the award presentation to just have an informal discussion um, about fashion education now. And we are recording, um, so again, tonight's events will be attached to the, um, the website um, of the of the Stutz research in, in due course. So I think um, without further ado, I can hand over to Caroline and to Linda. Hello. I'm Caroline Powell. I'm Linda Schwer. And thank you for coming to hear about our research on Anne Kagey, who is the chairman of fashion at Parsons from 1955 to 1983. Kagi was a woman with many strong views, and as our research will show, she may prove to be a controversial figure in the foundations of American fashion, and certainly in the history of Parsons. At the outset of her research, there was very little information available about Anne Kagi. Her name had very little presence online, and this was the only image of her that we had. We still know very little about her personal life and where she came from. We started our research in the New School archives where unfortunately Kagi was, has no box of her own, but it was suggested that we look through David Levy's and Ellen Austell's files who were deans during Kagi's time. In those boxes, we found many things including faculty listings and booklets, which are all online now thanks to the New School digital collections. Our research weaves together the disparate forms of testimonies we encountered. We have trace evidence of material she authored, which presents a challenge to making definitive claims to truth. We inspected transcriptions of interviews with former students, faculty, her successor, Frank Friso, and David Levy, who was Dean of Parsons from 1970 to 1984, to get a sense of what it was like to work with her. The faculty listings were a significant find for us because they told us more about Kagi's timeline. So we know she came to Parsons in 1947 as an instructor in the costume design department, listed as Anne Levady, no, with no H before her name. Then in 1952, she appears as Anne Levady Kagi. We assume this is the year she married James Rodman Kagi. In 1952, she's also listed as the assistant head of, to costume design. In 1953, she's listed as the head of costume design. In 1955, she's listed as the chairman of the department. We learned through these listings also about her education, most notably about her Bachelor of Arts from Pratt, which you can see. The next discovery came in the form of Kagi's resignation letter from 1982 which is our only significant piece of writing from Kagi that isn't just administrative. It gives us a glimpse into Kagi's personal sense of her major achievements and frustrations at Parsons. In the letter, Kagi outlines a recapitulation of the fashion department during her time, um, th during her time there so as to ensure the continuation of the department at a satisfactory level. The letter reads like a personal CV and resume, beginning with her arrival in 1946, she notes that while the costume design department was rather modest, I saw it as a challenge and I resolved I would make it the most outstanding, outstanding fashion design school anywhere. 
With all modesty, I believe I have achieved my goal. I don't think I could ever hope to accomplish more than what was demonstrated in our most recent annual show. In her resignation letter, Kagi also discusses the influence that Dorothy Shaver of Lord and Taylor had on her as an instructor and then as chairman. Not only had Dorothy Shaver promoted American fashion designers for decades through the American look, she had also initiated the designer critic program at Parsons and had brought in the program's first top designers such as Claire McCardle. In 1954, when Kagi became the head of the costume design department, one of the first major changes was to rename the department from costume design to fashion design, signaling a change in ideals. Fashion design and illustration were separated into two different degrees, and the description for the fashion program began. Designers of today have developed fashions which are distinctively American in character. The courses of this department are planned to prepare students for careers as professional designers in the fashion world. Kagi also made changes to the designer critic program and brought in new talents like Anne Klein and Norman Norella's critics, expanding the critics program that Dorothy Shaver had established to junior classes as well as senior classes. Later on, students would take merchandising and marketing classes so as to better prepare themselves for a rapidly evolving fashion industry on 7th Avenue. Kagi was aware of the changing environment of American fashion and was the fearless leader of her department. She believed strongly in the values of professionalism and discipline in American design that she saw in Norell, Klein, McCardle, and others, and she wanted Parsons students to represent these ideals too. Because of this, Kagi's investment in the program was extremely personal, and she would often be involved in the students' classes, even as chairman of the department. Students often noted her, quote, strictness and toughness, and she would often work overtime. In one letter from David Levy in 1978, he writes, Dear Anne, I was very much concerned to learn from Rod this morning that you have been under so much strain over the past few weeks. In this connection, there are a few thoughts that I would like to, like to share with you. Most important is the fact that Anne Kagi is one of the most needed and productive people at Parsons School of Design but not just to attend to the day-to-day -day routine. You are needed to give the school and the Department of Fashion Design its philosophical and educational guidance. So it is critical that you not mistake the forest for the trees, that you take the time to rest and get back in top shape. Parsons School of Design needs Ann Kagi very much, but not at the expense of her health and not every waking minute of every day. The annual fashion show was a special point of pride for Anne, and she played an integral role in its planning. Now, every program says produced by Anne Kagi, but there is no doubt that she was involved in every show. In this set of images from 1968, we have a sketch by Louis de Olio with Anne's 12-year-old daughter, Wendy, as a model. And on the right, we have a photograph of de Olio with Wendy at the annual fashion show wearing his design. Anne's ideas about professionalism and her investment in the running of the department also came with many drawbacks. We learned a great deal about Kagi through her interactions with David Levy, but most significant was the, was the frequency with which we were reading documents where Levy was essentially reprimanding Kagi, especially for inefficiencies and small dramas within the fashion department, but also in regards to Kagi's toughness and high standards. We know now that those standards were aimed more aggressively at some students than others, and that often Kagi played favorites amongst the students based on race. It's impossible not to address, as it is significant in considering the influence that Kagi had on the foundations of American fashion industry and on fashion education. For example, these letters detail the enforcement of a dress code within the fashion department that stated that men should wear a jacket and tie and that girls should never wear pants. Their choice to enforce a dress code underlines Kagi's traditional values of discipline and professionalism, but the record of incidents underline not just her traditionalist values, but her bias towards certain students. In this document, Viri Salvadori, the dean of students, recounts a meeting with a group of six students who report demeaning and racist encounters with Kagi. 
The six specific incidents described reveal racial prejudices and verbal and physical transgressions. Salvadori notes that the students who brought the above to my attention said that they could go on forever with similar statements and acts on Mrs. Kagey's part. However, they did not come to my office to get Mrs. Kigi, but rather to try to explain to me what it meant to be a student in fashion design. To be a student in fashion at this time was to work towards Kagi's standards. For 30 years, Kagi had fostered a culture of authority. In our interview with Tim Gunn, we learned that there was a lack of cohesion amongst the faculty and the climate within Parsons' classrooms was characterized by a tacit understanding that students had no voice. The standard was set by Kagi to acclimate students into an industry rather than define their own visions. In a 1994 interview with Marta Kosawin and Frank Rizzo, Rizzo says, Anne was formidable, but it was a different time. In the 50s, when you went to school, it was all about authority. Alan Gussow, who was the chair of, illustration, of the illustration department in the mid-60s, called her very much the superwoman and very tyrannical and had her terrain marked out. In an interview um, in 2010, Levy says, give Anne Ke Kege, the original chairman, her credit. We built it on the foundation that she built, that the procedures in that department today are no different than the procedures that were instituted. They were there in 1961. Multiple voices have reiterated her keen eye for executing a vision of a professional education and the strictness of enforcing her rules. Kagi resigned in 1982 at the age of 61. Four months after her resignation, a tribute was held in her honor with many of her former students and industry professionals in attendance. Among the crowd were Louis Del Olio, Donna Karen, and Donald Brooks. Part of the opening remarks read, it is impossible to talk about Parson's achievements without reference to our guest of honor. Parson's reputation is secure today in all areas of art and design education, but in one field, fashion design, it has been for three decades the single most important training ground and the source of its highest standards of professional excellence. For that standing, this institution, this industry, and this country must salute Anne Kagi. But despite this outpouring of recognition and thanks for her time in the fashion department, it seems that the memory of Anne Kagi quickly faded. In a letter to the New York Times a few days after the tribute, Ava Orleans Meyer, the director of PR at the time, wrote, the tribute last week doesn't demand your time as just another note about another party, and you know it. Meyer goes on to defend Kagi's legacy, saying, a story in the Times is the final stamp of validity for one of the most productive lives in the fashion business. She deserves that much. Despite Meyer's efforts, a full story was never run. Tim Gunn noted that the climate in the fashion department was to not mention the name of a dead pharaoh. It seems as though Kagi's name and her role in shaping Parsons and the American fashion industry has been buried. But to really understand American fashion, we must recover figures like Kagi. At the time of her resignation, it was said that Kagi had 900 alum working on 7th Avenue. We cannot conclusively say that these were students she taught personally, but all students who had gone through a program shaped largely by Kagi. The implications of recovering Kagi's biography are wide reaching and her influence is not limited to the fashion industry. Recovering her biography gives us a better understanding of American identity and politics and the factors that shape it. We must also consider that Kagi had connections to famous personalities such as Nancy Reagan, Betty Ford, and Joan Rivers who have influenced how Americans choose to dress. Recovering her biography gives us a better understanding of the genealogies of American fashion that both shape and are shaped by social identities. Social roles and values are projected onto consumer options, which demonstrates the embeddedness of culture and dress. How we choose to present ourselves is an expression of who we are or signifies belonging in certain social categories such as generation, class, gender, sexuality, and culture. Understanding the relationship between fashion and society still recover, re requires uncovering. We hope to continue the work so that other students and researchers 
and have a more complete picture of the fashion industry then and now and the role a formative figure played in defining it. We would also like to thank the New School Archivists who helped us tremendously, also Professor Hazel Clark, Gina Luria Walker, Beth Dinkoff, and Tim Gunn. Thank you. I'd like to ask questions. I'm going to use the mic so we can um, record. We should also say, and we didn't say actually, that that very first image and the image we've been using for the posters in the center is Anne Kagi on the left is Claire McArdle, uh, and it's from the archive. Does anyone have questions or comments? Hi, I just had a quick question. Uh, was she teaching as well, or was she mainly just the chairman? What was her involvement in the classroom, do you know? Yeah, um, she began teaching in 1946, and she became head of fashion in 1954. Did she continue teaching when she was a chairman? Yeah, but the extent to which she was involved is not quite clear. Do you know um, what location Parsons was in? Because uh, I know it's moved a few times, mm -hmm. and some of the letters said 66 Fifth Avenue, but then I don't know if the 30 years in Cup, you know, where, where were the locations? Yeah. You notice? Um, it's, it's very complicated. Um, in 1971, Parsons acquired its first permanent home here at 66 Fifth Ave and 70 Fifth Avenue. And in the mid-70s, the 7th Ave and 40th Street building was acquired. And previous to that, um, in the 50s, classes were taught in different buildings in Midtown in Long Island City, um, and it would move back to Midtown, but it was a temporary location. But it, um, when the school acquired the building on 7th Avenue, it was actually a really important moment for Anne, um, and she played a big role in designing those classrooms and the auditorium where like the fashion shows would be held. Um, it was a really important part of her time at Parsons, was securing those classrooms for her students. And she, was, she made a point to talk about it in her resignation letter as one of her <laughs> big frustrations. Well, I guess the, the main question about the critics program is whether, well, we talked about the climate in the classrooms being kind of like the students had no voice. Um, and we've also seen in communications with Levy that perhaps a lot of the designs weren't the students owned um, and that the critics were basically creating people that would make designs for them who could come work for them after they graduated. Um, so, yeah. It was, to our understanding, it was um, very helpful in placing students within the job market because they had the professional experience of being mentored by um, a designer who was already working in the industry. And when we spoke to Tim Gunn, he made it clear that it was very much antiquated by the time he became chair, and he called it an anachronism. So it might have been more timely during Kagi's time as chair, and subsequently less so. I, I just wanted to add that there's a, quite a few alums sitting here. <laughs> um, I must have been uh, at Parsons like five years after Ann Kagi re retired or resigned, and I was here while Frank Rizzo was here, and we were still working with the um, critics. And um, that was the time of the transition, and you know, I definitely think that it was time to change. And <laughs> What is your take, Fiona? <laughs> Fiona, what is your take? We, but we were all influenced and very much so by her legacy, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, we were given two critics a year, and we were to produce one look in the spring and one look in the fall. And we would work with uh, critics in our junior year and just to get acclimated to working with, you know, real designers. And then um, by the time you got to senior year, you would get two, uh, two critics, whereas in junior, you would just get one. 
Um, I remember I got Cynthia Steffi in the fall and Bob Mackey in the spring, you know, or, or the other way around. So you do your sketches, you meet with the critic, they work with you on selecting one of the looks, and, um, and then you get to go up to their showroom, and they also kind of mentor you, and they would come back to Parsons uh, two times, one to see the muslin and the second time to see the finished uh, garment. And you would sit in the Norel room, which was on the fifth floor, and everyone would be quiet and you couldn't talk. And um, it was, uh, was kind of like a privilege to be in that room because you really got to see the designers work with all the students. And I used to go to see everybody else's um, print session because we really had everyone we had Donna coming in, we had uh, Donald Brooks, Jeffrey Banks, uh, you name it, they were all uh, very involved at Parsons. And sure enough, the students really did get work there because it was almost like a pre-selection. <laughs> and if the, the crit really worked well with you or saw talent, they would either hire you or they would recommend you to friends or other um, designers in the industry. So. The learning process at the time was on the cusp of being outdated somewhat, but it was still functional as far as placement. The thing that I'll say is that every designer was very meticulous and particular about what their group looked like because each designer got about seven, eight students assigned to them. And so when the benefit show would open up, like they would have like, and this is the Louis the Lolio group, and this is the Donna Karen group. And so every, it was almost like they had their own mini collections that we did. So yes, that's what kind of ended up happening. Uh, but it was nevertheless learning experience. Yeah, I did. I worked with Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Although she was not my critic, I did work with Donna Karen <laughs> for many years. <laughs> Put me on the spot, Hazel. <laughs> um, I concur. I think it was very much about an assistance training. That is to say, you were given a direction, you worked as a team, you were given a fabric story. And so it was this... Um, almost like a training ground insofar as them testing you and then you learning essentially what it was like to be an, as an assistant designer at that time, which was very uh, supportive. You know, you weren't designing certainly as an assistant designer when you entered the room. Um, and it was very technically focused. I remember I had fittings with Michael Kors and it was very much often one fitting, but for many of us, three or four fittings where we would go to the Michael Kors studio and just very emphasis, you know, emphasizing fit and proportion, getting that right. Occasionally doing fabric developments and treatments, but everything fairly regulated by the designer themselves. But uh, yeah, it was it, to, to Francesca's point. It was quite um, it was quite an event. I'll never forget. It would be November. It would be pitch black outside, and the spotlights in that room were blazing, and it would be a packed room. Certainly for people like Donna Karen, it was this room that could hold maybe 50 people and there would be 100 people squeezed in. It was like seeing Liza Minnelli or something. It was <laughs> just such an event and it, everyone wanted to attend just to learn and, and, yeah, and see. I just remember, and there were people, there would be teachers like Miss, Miss Chepetta who would be standing there with the sketch and just writing all the notes on top of the sketch. <laughs> right. And then in the end, we would have to re-sketch that over <laughs> because it had you know, undergone quite a few changes. Um, and I just remembered also that uh, some of us that really wanted to go the extra mile, uh, we would um, submit sketches for the costume design with Donald uh, Brooks. Uh, no, with, um, is it Donald Brooks? Yeah. Um, so it was like an honor to be in that group and we could collaborate. And I think Fiona has some good stories <laughs> about that. Oh my gosh. Um, so, uh, you know, agreeing with everything that Francesca and Stephen said, it was definitely a different time. Like you mentioned Rizzo was speaking to in terms of um, the address 557th Avenue was like the Holy Grail of that's where your goal was to work in that address. It was very much like that's where all the designer um, 
designers wear. So they were very much tailoring you for a very specific um, postgraduate experience was quite specifically defined. And to Francesca's point, um, Donald Brooks would come up with a theme which was always very entertaining for the costumes. And I think my year it was vegetable vamps of the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> Yun Chang and I, we, you were paired up and we did um, the artichoke. So and we, we made these incredible costumes. And then that year actually, Henri Bandals showcased um, four of the pieces in their windows and ours was one of the pieces. But I mean, it was so creative and so fun to be working on the costumes. And then I worked with, for my critics, I worked with Anna Sui and Michael Kors and I won Michael Kors um, award that year. So, yeah, you know, to Stephen's point, they're absolutely, you were trained as an assistant designer. You're very much working within a theme that they set to their design aesthetic. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, everything I concur with everything you said. I mean, Isaac Mizrahi, when I was there as a student, was absolutely the most entertaining crit session that everybody wanted to see. Michael was very entertaining as well. So it was a, you know, it was a different culture. Um, yeah, smaller, yes. You know, there was maybe, I think my year, 93, had about 90 students. Um, so it was very small compared to where we are. But um, I was going to ask, actually, do you recognize any of the names of the faculty during Keggy's time? Could you speak to some of the faculty that were there on that list? Because we couldn't see it, clearly. Oh, on that list. Yeah, is there anyone you can read? Um, you well, these ones are pretty old. Any names that would be familiar to us today? Hey, you, um, you did mention Teresa Cipetta. Yeah. She, I know she's listed. Uh, Miss Namiki, is Namiki there? Miss Cipetta and um, and um, Namiki, uh, Reiko Hori, and um, there was um, Miss Fisher, Eileen Fisher, right? Fishman, Fishman. Um, there was another faculty that was also that I think would have uh, I I'll remember. Yeah, there were quite a few that, the reason I remember is that they would be like, oh, if Ann Keggy was here, oh my God, you know, this would <laughs> never go. <laughs> That's how I know Miss Keggy. I was like, you know, from, uh, yeah, for, yeah, exactly. We were, we were, that we were uh, lucky that she was not there anymore. <laughs> well, I think what's interesting about this image, which was the one that, um, it's the only image of Kagi that you find when you search the digital collections. Mm. Um, is she's like looking at a sw like a collection of swatches, and I can just hear her saying, "You're going to use this one." You know, yeah. there's no choice for the student. Just you're going to use this swatch. And I don't know if uh, Murray Essex was ever at the time of Kagi, or if she came uh, during Rizzo, because she was also ch an interim chair. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm going to just you know, speak to yeah some of the things that you revealed, and I think it was really interesting that um, uh, in your research, you know, you really kind of like touched on some very topical things that you know for me really resonate. And um, you know, I arrived in two thousand and ten, um, and when I arrived, my role was director of academic affairs, so it was really to uh, you know, look at the curriculum within the School of Fashion. So it's kind of interesting just hearing, uh, you know, the background to um, everything that you you um, described. Um, and it certainly, I think what I'm hearing, you know, was that it certainly wasn't a student-centered student, student -centered learning approach. I mean, and I get that that's a much more kind of like maybe contemporary context. So that, that, that's something that I think is interesting. Um, um, and I think there is still, you know, there's something that is, you know, definitely uncomfortable about, in, you know, great as also for you to just really speak to it as well, the, the piece about race. Um, and, you know, that could be maybe expected because of the time and um, all of that. But it's also interesting that 
you know, at points, you know, the, the, my experience was there's something about that that remained in the DNA. Um, and, you know, I think some of the things that we've had to often deal with have been, you know, particularly when the student body really shifted and um, went from being um, what it probably was at that time, you know, a very traditional um, American student body um, to uh, an increasingly international body of students. And um, I think one of the things that was always curious for me as well when I first arrived was the notion of teaching to, you know, the top 10% in a classroom, which would have meant, or was it the top 1%? The top 1%. I think it was the top 1%, um, which I could see could almost tie back in with that, that notion of, of race and, um, and discrimination that you would only focus on those people who would be able to fit into an industry standard as it was um, at the time. And um, yeah, I think it's an interesting, a really, really interesting observation, which I think has definitely shifted, but I think it has been you know, certainly in the DNA of how the the school has you know gone through its history and you know definitely has come out on the other side of that but thank you for just like really you know opening that up and like really creating a um a dialogue for us to really kind of keep exploring the dynamic of that so thank you yeah, and in our paper we also go into more detail about um some communications between Levy and the fashion department about admissions and Linda knows more. About Not new. <laughs> Not new. <laughs> right. There's also, um, there have been some documents breaking down the statistics of the backgrounds of students, and there was some concern within administration of who could receive what funding, and that also would tell which students proceeded on with their education. Um, and we began to notice increasingly that these documents were turning up. Well... I think you'll notice that a, there's not a lot about her early life in this. That's one of our biggest gaps is we know she went to Pratt and there's these other schools mentioned, but we don't know when she attended those places, what she studied. Um, we know she's from Cleveland, but we don't know anything else about her family or her background. Um, so we've tried to get in contact with her family and other people who may have known her personally and haven't had a lot of success. That's, I mean, that's a big challenge. We were also very suspicious of what testimonies we were receiving um, or just encountering through oral history projects. And we perused all the transcripts for her name and accounts of her to get a fuller sense of what her personality was like because that much, that was very much a part of her job as well. Um, she worked so hard that she was such a presence in the school. And there were moments where we had to be suspicious of whether someone was being hyperbolic. Um, the numbers would change all the time. You know, someone would say that the program started with 70 students and then it would end with 25 or it would be like 40 and then 12. Um, but from that, you can glean a sense of um, where the intersections of the testimonies come together. And that's what we decided to work with. Yeah. And we hope that her diaries and her record, because we know th there's notes that say that she had vast records and you know tracked all of her, alum her alums and stayed in contact, but we haven't seen any of those. Um, so hopefully they're still out there for us to find. Um, well, I will say it's really exciting to see research like this done using um, the materials that are in the archives because it, um, we have pretty extensive records, especially of um, fashion design going back um, because the archives started um, sort of, uh, it started with Parsons materials um, and um, was, had a, uh, a special um, uh, impetus for at the beginning with, um, by Tim Gunn and so many fashion materials came into the archives early on. Um, we have um, all of the student croquis from, gosh, when did they date them? I think um, the early 50s through the late 90s or 2000s. 
I mean, every student croquis that was done, we have in the archives. So they're really extraordinary record of the, um, you know, of the evolution of the kind of work that was being done. Um, uh, what to say? I mean, I, th I think there's really a lot, uh, there's a lot to be mined there, but it's true we don't have Nkegi's records. It would be, w it would be really amazing if we had her diaries, um, and we don't. So, I mean, there's, like in many different archives, there, there are a lot of gaps, there are holes, you know, where, where one is sort of left to um, try to sort of interpolate from what is, from the traces that are there, out and then to go out into the world and try to try to fill some of that in, um, which can be um, incredibly time consuming and uh, frustrating, but also um, really rewarding. Um, and I just wanted to speak to um, Fiona's um, comment about the vegetable vamps. Um, we have many, I think we might have all of the um, designs for those amazing costumes. Um, and also have photographs of the completed costumes and now, um, um, have digitized audiovisual materials, so we have from the fashion benefit um, all of the runway shows, including the fabulous um, costume, Donald Brooks costume uh, extravaganzas every year. So they're really exciting to see. Those will be online at some point. <laughs> I, I don't want to promise when, but uh, hopefully within a year or so we'll have all of those online. Uh, so I'm just, you know, like, it's fascinating to know that we have an archive. This archive is a mystery. I'm, I'm teaching here fifth year. I've done my well, master's in fashion studies. And I'm just wondering how, what is it that is collected there? I understand students work, if there is anything else, like what part of Parsons heritage we have there, and who can access it, and how complicated is that? I'm so sorry you haven't heard of us. We're right there, right next to <laughs> the corner behind that gray door. Um, we're open to anybody, in, including all of New School community, but also to the general public. Um, and um, we have a website. Um, we're part of the libraries, so if you go to the library site, there's a, there's a link uh, to our uh, main website, which lists all of our collections on it. Um, and all you need to do is um, write to us or call us, and you're welcome to come in and look at any of it that you'd like to. So please, please do come. <laughs> we try. I just want to say that we, we do try to get the word out that we're there. Um, we um, often do um, orientations for classes at the beginning of the year, but um, you know, there's there's a lot going on at this school, so it's hard it's hard sometimes to. I have a quick question. Um, do you know why they were collecting sketches and croquis from the students? Was this like a regular, you know, maybe Fiona or Francesca or Stephen? Was it something that they were just collecting at the end of the year? Or was it like, what is this practice? Because, I mean, when we, the process of um, working with a critic, you would do your hand painted or marker um, sketch. And so that became, like Francesca was referencing earlier, so this piece that they constantly reference back to in terms of that process of working with the critics. So they would have that entire set of the original artwork that w they would work with for each, each year, with each semester, I guess, with each particular critic. So they would have all of that. They kept the sketches at the office because when the critic would come in, they would take it from the office and uh, bring them so they could work on it. We didn't take the sketches home. <laughs> and then, in the end, um, because everybody had a different sketching style, like, I don't know if the, the designer sketched that, but there was, a, after a certain period, I think it was Bill Rensatelli that sketched <laughs> all yeah, we the heard that. winning, all of them. <coughs> so I don't know <coughs> what year that that happened what what do you think <laughs> or michael volbrack also may have yeah, been sketching have them all sketch. yeah. just so to have that a uniform style <coughs> of illustrations mm -hmm. well, yeah. we also heard that um Kagi would tell students with bad illustrations to have another student who is better at illustrating to do, do their for sketch them. for them so i think that's what made maybe 
uh, made this happen. I have, I have just a, a final question. Have you ever seen some of the sketches being produced by the designers you were working for? Because, you know, it's so industry focused. I don't know if you've seen any parallel to the, you know, the upcoming collections by the designers or anything, if you saw similarities. We did not have enough time to go through okay. all that, But um, I, I think also these sketches were really important. Um, we found like handwritten notes by Kagi and, you know, this, this lovely Wendy, a sketch for Wendy Kagi. And even on an, another version of this outfit, it says, Kagi's brown shoes. So we know that she brought her shoes from home to wear on the runway. And you never know when these things are going to, you're going to need these things later. I think that's, you never know when someone's going to be famous and you want to see their sketches from when they were students and things like that. Thanks for the questions. I'm going to now invite Alan Greenberg from the um, Stutz Trust to say a few words and to make the awards. Good evening. By the way, um, Donald Brooks actually shared a townhouse with Geraldine Stutz. So um, he worked quite closely with her and was a big... Uh, uh, had a lot of his designs at Bendel's. I heard Bendel's was mentioned. Something was done there as part of the... So Brooks was a very important part of her life. They were very, very close friends. I think we lost Donald just a few years ago. It was fairly recent. Unfortunately, so you don't have him to interview about some of the things you're talking about. So you interview soon because, you know, you lose some people. And, um, and, you know, it's funny. I'm very involved with the dance division at the public library. And... You never know what to collect and what's going to be relevant 100 years from now. So it's, it's hard to say. But as you said earlier, uh, maybe a student's designs or what have you. Um, my co-director, Emma Turner, could not make it uh, here from London. I wish to thank Hazel, Clark, and Parsons for not only gathering us here today to celebrate the Stutz Awards, but for their long-term interest in Geraldine Stutz's legacy. Uh, as Professor Clark just mentioned, uh, as a result of this interest, the Stutz Fellowship, which was enacted in 2013 as a three-year research project focused on women in New York fashion, placing Geraldine's accomplishments along those of other underrecognized women who were key to the development, business, and creative impact of New York fashion in the 20th century. This three-year research culminated in a discussion at a symposium entitled, as you saw, Women in New York Fashion, 20th Century Retail Masters. Additionally, this research resulted in a treasure chest of material, again, what we were talking about earlier, including a collection of exhibition galleries called Camelot on 57th Street, a history of Henry Bendel, perfect picture advertising the store, Geraldine Stutz, Merchant Princess, the Street Theater, the windows at Henry Bendel, all which can be found on the Parsons website. Now, before I present Geraldine, this Geraldine Stutz Award to our second cohort of awardees, let me share a little bit about Geraldine the person. Geraldine was married, loved her stepchildren. One is who my co-director. Uh, she was really an innovator who really tried to nurture new talent, mentioning Donald as an example. I believe what made her, though, so successful in the world of fashion was her many areas of passionate interest including theater and gardening. She had a beautiful gardens in Roxbury, Connecticut, which was initially worked on under the guidance of renowned British gardener, Russell Page. You may know his name, you may see his design if you go up to the Frick. There's been a lot of controversy of what to do with that, and thank God that's same, but that's Frick, and, that worked, and she worked with people like that in the gardening area. Uh, she collected beautiful items. If any of you are familiar with Majolica, she had an amazing collection of Majolica. So I think those interests with a great deal of tenacity and hard work not only served her well during one of the most successful retail establishments in New York City, but in her life after selling Bendel's. What did she do after? I don't know if anyone's familiar. But she went on to establish her own company called Panache Press, where under that name, in conjunction with Random House, she started creating books focusing on the likes of Andy Warhol, Elsie DeWolf, who many of you probably know was an interior designer. She was known as the Queen of Chintz. Bobby Short, you may have known the infamous cabaret uh, singer. 
Christopher Idone, who's a celebrated chef and culinary author, probably saw him in the Times from week to week. Uh, and Susan Colgan was a painter. So her interests were far-ranging, far diverse. I sometimes call her a Renaissance woman. She was even, at this point in her career, thinking of going back into retail, believe it or not. Um, she was thinking of another adventure called Well Read. It was going to be the best of all the bookstores. She was going to have the best book sections, whether it's theater. We had uh, applause for those of you who may remember on West 71st. She was going to take that and put this in the store. Best mystery, best wine. She was also going to serve coffee and much more. Again, she was ahead of her time. Just walked by a Starbucks today with everyone with their laptop and drinking coffee. She was combining it with books. Today, the Geraldine Stutz Trust, established by Geraldine, continues to support organizations in areas she was passionate about, fashion, the arts, and gardening. Last year was the initial year of the Stutz Award. Awardees discuss designs of New York fashion from the 40s to the 80s, including that of the popover dress, which was brand new to me, but apparently it was a very important item back in the 40s. I believe Geraldine would be humbled today and proud especially after hearing the presentations of our two awardees, Carolyn Powell and Linda Shway, to have her name attached to an award to you both. I want to thank you both for the research you've shared with us here today, and that research could, I know, be shared for future generations. Now, let me tell you a bit about each of this evening's awardees before we give them the award. Carolyn is a recent graduate of the Integrated Design Program at Parsons with a focus in design studies. Her work melds design, research, and art making to illustrate the possibilities of new knowledge ordering systems. As a designer for the new Historia, she has helped visualize and create new concepts for understanding a vast network of female biographies. Other topics of research have included modernism and utopia, storytelling through archives, and experimental filmmaking. Linda studies philosophy at Eugene Lang College and integrated design at Parsons School of Design. She is interested in the ways of art and design shape life and the organization of societies, individual and collective memories, and the production and diffusion of knowledge throughout time and around the world. By merging theory and practice, she has been working with the new Historia to invent new possibilities of imagination. She dreams of a time before science, art, and philosophy were discrete fields of study. I would like to welcome you both to join me now as we formally recognize you as Geraldine Stutz Award recipients. And I guess we're going to ask everyone to have a toast at this time. Uh, Hazel, would everyone maybe want a glass of whatever of their choices? I'm just going to ask everyone to just have a toast and have some informal conversation. Congratulations to you both of you are holding things now. I've given you all these things. But they've gotten an award, which I'd like to show at least one of them. Excuse me. So they each have gotten an award. And as we could see, the photo we were referring to here, which you're saying that she's saying definitely <laughs> choose this one. So I don't know if you can capture it here a little better. Or am I probably too far on the side? I can read it, though. Uh, Women in New York Fashion, the second annual Geraldine Stutz Award. This is hereby granted to and both ones for Linda and Caroline. It's outstanding scholarship in researching the work as an under-recognized woman key to the development, business, and creative impact of New York fashion in the 20th century and granted on this day and assigned by Hazel Clark and myself. Congratulations again, and I toast you both. And to everyone here.